Good morning, everyone. Don Gillis here with Emerson. I'm in Sydney, Ohio at the Copeland plant and it's Fun Fact Friday. Today, as I promised, I'm going to talk a little bit about Nat's refrigerants, specifically about CO2. What I'm going to do is uh, first of all, we're going to, to approach the terminology of some of the peculiarities of the CO2 and just walk through a handful of things and try to keep this as short as possible. Okay, this is mostly going to be focused for the supermarket people right now. There are residential systems from what I'm being told in the Asian market. Uh, they're not here yet. Um, don't get me wrong, a lot of great HFOs out there, but Due to the EPA regulations coming down the pipe, if you're in the supermarket world, you if you haven't seen CO2, you probably will. And I'm not trying to fear fact you here, uh, scare you. It just has a very low global warming potential. And that global warming potential, by the way, is one. Uh, what that means to you is uh, global warming potential for, let's say, 404A is approximately 3,900. So it's a ratio, and those ratios are all based off of CO2. That's the starting point. They gave it the number one. So in other words, 3,900 pounds of uh, CO2 are the equivalent of one pound of 404A. It is a ratio. Uh, for you residential folks, uh, guys and gals, R22, for example, has a global warming potential of approximately 2,000 or 1,900, okay? I'm going to start with some basic terminology and let's talk with critical point. Critical point, all refrigerants have a critical point. CO2 just happens to have a very low critical point. For example, our critical point for CO2 is 1070 PSIA. That would be 1055 PSIG if you remember correctly how we do atmospheric pressure. Uh, the temperature at the critical point for CO2 will be 87.8 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? That is, to put that in comparison, uh, R22's critical point is 202 or somewhere thereabouts, 202 degrees Fahrenheit. So we don't talk about the critical point on R22 because we never see 202 degrees, uh, degrees Fahrenheit outside on the planet Earth but we will see 87.8. So it's a very low critical point. The triple point, again, all refrigerants have triple point. The triple point as defined as solid, liquid, and vapor coexisting, all three of those coexisting. The triple point for CO2 just happens to be fairly high in comparison with every other refrigerants. Example, the triple point temperature is for CO2 minus 69.8. The pressure is 75.1 PSIA. To put that in comparison to R22, the PSIA is 0 0.073. We're never going to see that, and that's why we don't talk about it. So we have a very low critical point at the very top of our saturated curve. We have a very high triple point where solid vapor and liquid coexist. All right? Remember, our critical point is defined there at the top of our saturation curve. When we're at the critical point, the liquid and gas densities are equal. Above that, there is no pressure temperature relationship. And below that are PT charts. That's the world we typically live in. That's a good world to be in. We're in that two phase area, pressure and temperature. We have liquid and we have vapor. We're saturated. That's what, that's what our PT charts or our gauges are showing us, okay? Oops. Um, Talk about subcritical. What does subcritical mean? Subcritical is meaning that you're below. So let's say this is a rack system for you supermarket folks. This is our low temperature rack. This is our medium temperature rack. Again, we're below that critical point. The temperature outside is lower than 87.8 degrees. The low temperature rack is never going to see ambient air. So it's always going to be running in subcritical. The reason for that is it's actually tied in. It shares a suction line with the medium temperature rack on the CO2 and it is removing the heat on the low temperature via the medium temperature rack through a brace plate heat exchanger acting as a condenser and it's re rejecting the heat there. It's transferring that 
like you have in geothermals on the coax, if you will, if you understand geothermal. So we're removing that heat and the medium rack is then taking it outside to the condenser and rejecting that heat as we normally would. When we go, when we get above 87.8 degrees with CO2, the condenser now sees the ambient temperature, okay? And this gets bigger, okay? This medium temperature then goes up higher. We're raising our temperature, we're raising our pressure. Pressure temperature no longer exists here relationship-wise, all right? The, there, that is neither a liquid or a vapor above the critical point. It is referred to as a transcritical fluid. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but the condenser, we can't condense the refrigerant at that point above that critical point, basically is what it amounts to. So it never condenses, all right? The condenser then turns into a gas cooler, all right? We're rejecting heat, but we're just not condensing, all right? So that's the terminology of subcritical, below the critical point. Transcritical is above the critical point. In certain areas of the world, let's say Canada, for example, we would primarily be in subcritical all the time, but they purposely at, let's say, where you need sanitiz sanitization, uh, whether you're working with fish or, or anything to do with sanitary, cleaning up, if you're working with food, meats, anything like that, where you use a high volume of hot water, they purposely push that in transcritical, they manipulate the pressures to utilize that heat uh, from the transcritical, okay? They reclaim that and they use it for water, they use it for heat, they use it for dehumidification. So there's a good side to that. Unfortunately, if you're running in transcritical, that's where the knock comes in on CO2. You have to figure out ways to manipulate that because that's where it doesn't really shine as best as it does in subcritical. In transcritical, you have to use things like adiabatic coolers. Uh, uh, sub-mechanical, uh, sub-coolers, uh, things like ejectors you're seeing a lot in Europe, okay? But there are a lot of different high ambient strategies that are used all around the world. Make no mistake about it, CO2 is very earth-friendly, very, very good for the environment. All natural refrigerants are, ammonia, propane, what have you. But don't think it's just about in the environment. For example, HFC's low temperature, an average or somewhere thereabouts on the compression ratio is 10 to 1. Remember, discharge pressure up here, suction pressure up here. The farther those numbers, the less efficient that a compressor is. In comparison to CO2, a low temperature uh, compression ratio is 2 to 1. So those numbers are closer, which makes it much more efficient. The piston size on a semi metric is about a third of an HFC piston. The scroll compressors are skinny down, if you will, so a lot, lot more efficient, better transfer of heat. So don't just think it's about the environment, all right? Natural refrigerants are very, very good at efficiency. That's why they use them. The propane is, is very, very efficient, all right? So that's subcritical. That's, uh, so if we're below that critical point, we're 87.8 degrees, we're in subcritical. That's what that term means. Transcritical, we discussed, that's above the critical point. We are neither a vapor or a liquid, we're a uh, supercritical fluid, okay, or a transcritical fluid. And we talked about the triple point. And I believe that's all I have for you, except I want you to go, I'm gonna attach this to, the, to my video. I'm also gonna attach this CO2 booklet that Emerson made. I believe my friend, uh, coworker, team member up there in Canada, Andrea Patanon, uh, had a good uh, part to deal with this. Uh, go to ed educational.emerson.com. I'll apply that link to. That's all of our course offerings, whether they're instructor-led, e-learning. Right now on the e-learning, due to COVID and the restriction of traveling back in March until now, uh, we have offered a lot of our courses for free at education.emerson.com. Go in there and take advantage of them. Uh, I'm not sure if they'll be extended after the end of 2020. So take advantage of them now if you will. Okay? Excuse me. So I'm Don Gillis from Emerson. I work in educational services. That's your fun fact Friday. One more little tidbit for you. Did you know that minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it's also minus degree, minus 40 degrees Celsius? I don't know if you knew that or not.
So that's your fun facts for today, gang. I appreciate you tuning in. Check for my links, whether they're on top or at the bottom. Again, I'm Don Gillis with Emerson from Sydney, Ohio. Have a great weekend. If you're on call this weekend, please, please, please be careful out there. Look out for each other and share your knowledge, okay? Thanks a lot, gang. Bye.